All right, this is, um, I was getting to my introduction. So I'm a senior control vocabulary editor at Gale, a part of Cengage Learning, and I'm author of The Accidental Taxonomist. See me if you want to get a copy. Um, I also teach an online course in taxonomies. I'm currently uh, chair, a member of the board of the American Society for Indexing. So if you want to know where to get indexers, freelance contract, that's where to go. You can ask me about that. And I've had some other um, professional activities as well. Okay. I'm just about Cengage. It's an educational publisher. And then it has a division, um, Gale, that does the, the reference and database of the publishing. Uh, I did distribute these slides to everybody that had the list. You don't have to take great detailed notes. And I've got, I'm going to go through a little more quickly. So my outline is going to talk about indexes indexing and controlled vocabularies. It might be pretty basic, uh, but just so we're all on the same page. So indexes, I found this nice definition um, from NISO, uh, National Information Standards Organization Technical Report. A systematic guide designed to indicate topics or features of documents in order to facilitate retrieval of documents or parts of documents. And what's nice about this definition, it's pretty comprehensive because it covers both indexes for a whole document like a book or parts of it, uh, you know, it could be periodical indexes or other kinds, and whether it's displayed or not displayed, whether it's manually or automated, um, how it's created. So further in this document, I found that there were different ways to even classify indexes, uh, many different kinds, like what's the object, uh, object referred to, how, you know, there are subject indexes and author indexes, uh, the types of terms or headings, it could be uh, names or topics, what it's based on, uh, full text, abstract citations, the arrangement of the entries, alphabetical is of course traditional, but you could have other ways. Um, the indexing method, whether it's manual or automated, and we're going to talk about that in this session. Uh, term selection, where do the terms for the index come from? Are they derived from what's in the text or are they from a controlled vocabulary externally or some combination? Term coordination, that's a little more complex topic, but it has to do with uh, pre-coordination, meaning you have uh, main headings and subheadings or subdivisions already created in the index, such as in the back of the book index. You see this in Library of Congress subject headings, a main heading and a subheading. And there are some um, online periodical indexes that do that too. More common is to have it left for post-coordination where the end user combines the index terms in a, a Boolean search or a guided advanced search. And then topic, a document or genre can vary. The medium, print, electronic. Of course, microform has kind of gone by the wayside. And, and finally, periodicity. Is it a one-time closed index as for a book or monograph or something that's continuing and ongoing and added to as in periodicals or other images or other kind of uh, index? And that's um, actually what I want to focus on in my next uh, two slides. The, these differences. The one-time closed index, this is the back of the book index or monograph. The index is created for a single work and then it's done. That's why they say it's closed. And index entries point to page numbers or to section numbers. The index is typically displayed to the users. The index entries are unique to that work, to that book or monograph. Uh, it may be a multi-volume work that has one index for or the collection of volumes, but it, the reason the work is in multi-volumes is because of the large size. We're not talking about a journal that has a volume for every year. Uh, and even if a, a, a book has subsequent editions, each edition has its own index that uh, could be based on a previous version, but it, because you know, different pa the pagination probably has changed, the flow has changed in new editions. Then what we can call continuing or open indexes. And this is traditionally the periodical article or other database index where uh, records are continually added over time. And they comprise multiple documents by multiple creators, which also means that different authors are using different language, they're different terms as opposed to a, a book. So the index entries will um, point instead of to a page or a section, they're pointing to a unit which could be an article or a, an image or some other record. 
The indexes may or may not be displayed to the end users, especially in uh, online form. They might just be searching and getting a little glimpse of a uh, few words of it, but not the whole index. Uh, so the index entries then point to um, references in different works, not just one book. And then, so typically there is a controlled vocabulary to provide consistency over time and over different works. And now a continuing index could of course discontinue, let's say a journal ceases publication, but the, the, we still call that a continuing index because it was intended to go on, it didn't have a, a termination planned. So I mean here's some examples, it's pretty basic, uh, excerpt of the back of the book index, the locators mean where it's pointing. So page number, single locator, multiple, separated by a comma, range with a, uh, a dash in between. The sub-entries are typically indented. Then there's uh, see also references. So there's another term you might be interested. And uh, see cross-references. This is especially used in the back of the book index where you have multiple sub-entries. So if you just have a few page numbers, you could put it in both places. We call that a double post. The same style is carried over into print periodical indexes, which we don't use that much anymore, but you probably recognize um, Reader's Guide to Periodical Literature, you know, those green printed volumes that we found in the reference um, sections of libraries. So the reference locators are not page numbers, they're full citations of the uh, article. You could have a single or multiple one under the topic. Um, and then also the, the subdivisions, like sub-entries, they're centered. Accounting is a subdivision uh, of employee health insurance. There are also C, the C also references, and the C cross-references. So the same features are in the, the um, periodical as in the back of the book index, just displayed a little differently. But nowadays, of course, we go to online, and this one, of course, I took an example from Gale. <laughs> um, it's a little, you do have the subdivisions, but of course the user has to click on the button to then get the, the list of subdivisions. We have see also references, they just call them related subjects. Uh, see cross references, we have a see there. So there's still some of the, the features from um, a traditional index. So moving on to indexing, of course that's creating an index um, <laughs> And link or linking the topics to index entries. But it's based on analysis of determining what's meaningful concept, not just words. So we're not talking about a simple index of a search in engine that just lists, you know, pulls out words. We're getting the concepts, the ideas. So indexing for the one time close back of the book index is um, typically done. A single indexer does a single book. The indexer reads the book, determines what the main topics are how to describe them, what will the terms be at the back of the book index, uh, and what will be C references, double posts, uh, what are going to be um, sub-entries. What happens is when you've got too many pages, like beyond five locators, then you need to break these up into subdivision groupings and de determining what those subdivisions are because they're unique to each main entry. Uh, and decide when to create see also references. So it's an integrated process. The, the indexer creates the index terms and is providing the locators to the page numbers at the same time. So it's quite different from the continuing open index process, uh, which typically involves multiple indexers um, and uh, they're, they're using a shared indexing system together so they would skim or view the, the articles or other a digital assets. And then there was some set policies or guidelines for indexing. So it's done consistently by different indexers with dealing with different materials. Uh, and they're using a control, yeah, they, so then they also use a controlled vocabulary to provide consistency among different indexers over time and with different sources. You've got three variables here, you know, different people, of a span of time, like they might have not indexed this, something like that, for months and didn't remember how they did it before, and different documents with different authors. Uh, and then, let's see, they may, they may only use what's in the control vocabulary, except for certain circumstances, maybe they can propose, or maybe they can add new names, and then they kind of proceed from one, one article and then on to the next. So software for indexing, um, 
So the closed index, there are um, uh, single user uh, software for managing the, the process. They don't use index cards anymore. <laughs> There's also embedded indexing features in some publishing softwares, um, and uh, Dave's going to talk a little more about embedded indexing, but that's where instead of creating an index offline from the book, PDF, or whatever they're looking at, is to actually embed markers in at certain places and then have them linked to the index. Uh, and then there are also on the kind of in the other direction, there are tools to embed index tags in XML documents. And I'm aware of one software package to semi-automate um, the closed book indexing uh, method. So for continuing indexing, um, you could use software, these packages for that intended for closed back of the book indexing for periodical indexes. If you know they're on a small scale, uh, then there's add-on control, because some control vocabulary management software might have an add-on for indexing. And of course, organizations that have a lot of indexing to do will have their own proprietary program. But there really, there isn't, you can't go out there and buy a package for indexing periodicals by a bunch of groups. I mean, there's just, you get the control vocabulary, there's automated indexing, there's software for book indexing. But when it comes to doing open, continued indexing, that part of it, there's just these different options. And of course, then there's automated indexing, which it's a good idea to review it manually. <laughs> And we'll have more about that. We have some screenshots from the two main back of the book closed indexing programs, Syndex and Sky Index. Syndex, you can even see that their little box here kind of looks like an index card. Um, embedded indexing. I, I, haven't, I took this screenshot. This is from InDesign, where you can you know, embed a marker uh, for the place where the index should point to. And I mentioned one. But, uh, tool for automating the process of back of the book indexing called text tract. Um, I don't actually have experience with that, but I, I know who uh, is involved with that. And then this is um, my employer at Gale. When we do open uh, periodical indexing, this is a, a, a proprietary system. We have the indexer views the text on the right and then put, assigns index terms um, on the screen, uh, window on the left, and then it calls up the control vocabulary and scrolls it, searches or browses it. So automated indexing, I'm going to not go into too much detail because we do, Margie's going to talk about it more. We hear of auto indexing, which really tends to refer to text extraction uh, or data mining, pulling the concepts out of the text. Uh, it may or may not involve a control vocabulary. Auto categorization or auto tagging, those other ones do involve a controlled vocabulary. And there are two main methods um, machine learning and um, rules based. I'll go into the next slide. Uh, and they can also leverage a combination of technology. So you can have text analytics along with auto categorization. Uh, so the, the two main kinds, in addition to text analytics for auto categorization, is a machine learning where you have already indexed documents, articles, uh, correctly indexed, and you kind of feed those to the system and say, do it like this, more like this. You know? So you're training the system, which has algorithms and uses whatever logic to figure out <laughs> how to do it like that. Um, so you need already to have a pre-existing set. And then the rules base, uh, you don't need to have a pre-existing set of indexed. Uh, and you have people who write rules for each term, saying, you know, what are the synonyms and other issues of proximity and terms and combination. So it's a little bit like you're doing a Boolean search in reverse, <laughs> giving instructions like that. Um, and uh, so I get, Margie will talk more about those in details. So finally, control vocabularies, which is now my expertise since I used to do indexing, now I do control <laughs> vocabularies. Uh, so control vocabulary is a restrictive list of terms um, used to support indexing. And you can also look at it, if you're kind of coming from the angle of metadata, that it's a list of terms or values for a metadata field. Some of them have control vocabularies and some of them don't. But it's controlled because it's not the indexer can't just use whatever they want. I mean, there's somebody like me, a control vocabulary editor, who will research and decide, should we add a new topic to our control vocabulary and then approve it and put it in. 
Other features are optional, such as having variants or synonyms or relationships between terms, and those determine what kind of control vocabulary. Uh, the benefits and uses are, um, I think, pretty obvious, right? It, you know, supports the consistency when you have multiple indexers, multiple con sources of content over time. And uh, so as in the next slides, I'll show that it supports uh, syno synonymy, <laughs> resolves synonymy. So if you have synonyms, uh, then users would, might call it by different things, but you'll get, get them together and resolve right, polysemy. <laughs> having um, one term word having multiple meanings. Actually, I, go, I have examples on the next slide. So synonymy, you could have automobiles or cars, it might, documents might have different words in it, users might call it different things, but in the control vocabulary, you decide one is the preferred, the others are non-preferred or, or alternative labels, and they will redirect. Redirect from those that are indexing, redirect for those that are uh, searching and retrieving. And polysemy is having one word kind of multiple meanings, so such as the word monitors, maybe it was meant to mean computer monitors, but if you didn't have it, it controlled and someone's just doing a free text search, they get the, the word having other meanings. Okay, so a taxonomy is a specific kind of controlled vocabulary where the terms are arranged in a hierarchy of broader, narrower parent-child relationships and kind of groups them all together in, in one or a limited number of hierarchies. And there's, so there's this focus on categorizing. Uh, it may or may not have those uh, synonyms or um, alternative labels redirecting, kind of depending on the size. The example here is from the Integrated Public Services vocabulary of the United Kingdom. It shows, you know, the idea of how a hierarchy of, of concepts would be. And a thesaurus is another kind of controlled vocabulary the, the, the distinctions between a taxonomy and thesaurus can be blurred. You can have features of one and the other. Um, but it has certain standard structured relationships, uh, hierarchical, so like a taxonomy, broader term, narrower term, but not all the terms need to be in one big hierarchy because they're also associative relationships, so related terms, and that, you think back to the back of the book index, that's like the C also. And then the qu equivalents, um, where you have use of synonyms or more technically non-preferred terms that redirect and the relationship is used and it's reciprocal, used for. So I said, it doesn't all have to be in, in a limited number of neat hierarchies. So we look at usually kind of enter a thesaurus term by term and you have a term record like this one for folk music. The UF stands for used for, uh, BT is broader term, NT is narrower term, RT is related terms. You see, you might have multiple narrow terms and related terms. And this is useful both for the, especially manual indexers. They will browse this and they will then be able to find the ideal term. Uh, it may or may not be all displayed to the end users. It, it depends. If you have subject matter experts and it's more focused area, they might also like to see the full thesaurus as well. And there are standards for, for thesauri. There are no standards exactly for taxonomy. They're kind of best practices. But for thesauri, um, I didn't put the full name in here, but ANSI, NISO, and ISO standards. And there, actually, taxonomy and thesauri are only some of the different, there are even more different kinds of controlled vocabularies. And they're ranged here from the simplest to the most complex. Um, like a pick list you might just have for document type, article type. Uh, authority file is often used for uh, names of people because people aren't put into a hierarchy. <laughs> we don't need those hierarchical relationships. Okay, and then uh, finally software for taxonomy, thesaurus, or control vocabulary management. So these are the different kinds. There's dedicated uh, thesaurus management software. Uh, there is taxonomy creation or editing kind of component or module of some other software, our content management, digital asset management, um, SharePoint has a feature too. Uh, then there's vertical market software, and you might be in industries like that, especially in, in um, STEM fields, where uh, they're also dealing with the classifications, and they'll probably even provide taxonomies already in, in their systems. And of course, there are proprietary systems as well. So I'm just going to conclude with some screenshots of um, some of the, the number, the first ones, these dedicated um, the source management software that uh, you might, just so you get an idea what it kind of looks like. This one, uh, Multitest, is a single user Windows system. 
And it's, it's the source space, so it has an alphabetical list. Uh, and then one's in italics, so the non-preferred terms. You select a term here, aerial views, and you get the term record. And here, I mean, it's, if you can see, there's the UF used for broader term, narrower term, and you can add more relationships. Uh, this is Synaptica. Um, it's higher, it, the default, multitest is the only one that does default alphabetical. The rest of them kind of move into the, more of the taxonomy realm and have the default display is hierarchical, and then you select a term and then get the term record. Again, you can see um, broader term, narrower term. Associations would be related terms. We don't have any there. And, and also options for notes. This one is pool party. Uh, also the hierarchical view on the left, select a term and details on the right. And data harmony thesaurus manager, this is from Axis Innovations. Uh, which has a hierarchical view. You, you can, what I like about this one is you can toggle, you can get an alphabetical view and other views in the left as well and the term details. So that's it. Let's see how far we are behind time. Um, and if I might take just one or two real quick questions if there were anything that really wasn't clear about what I said. Uh, otherwise we will move on to our next speaker. We will have questions at the end as well. Any questions? Okay. So.